Hello everybody, welcome back to my educational channel Edis English Literature. I am Ardhendu Dev. Today, we are going to enter into the world of Shakespearean sonnets. At least, we will try to understand Shakespearean type of sonnets and particularly we are going to discuss argumentative technique as used in his sonnet number 116 Let me not to the marriage of two minds. You can take it as critical appreciation, but first of all, a few words on Shakespearean sonnets. Sonnets of William Shakespeare, a sequence of 154 sonnets by English poet and playwright William Shakespeare. A majority of them were written between at the late hours of 1600. Uh, in the time between 1595 to 1599. As for reference, we can tell that after the Earl of Southampton became his patron, the composition of his sonnets were probably dating that time. The sonnet jar was at its highest by that time. The tradition of sonnet writing from the Latin to Petrarch and Dante is being copied and followed by Ward, Sari, Sidney, Penser and Shakespeare too followed this. His sonnets, however, differed from those of other predecessors in that it had three decasyllabic quatrains, each rhyming alternatively and a rhyming couplet at the end. So, in most of the sonnets, the rhyme scheme, or probably all of his sonnets, the rhyme scheme follows A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G. Now, talking about Shakespearean sonnets, what I share this little information is very essential. You know all probably that Thomas Thorpe registered them the sonnets of William Shakespeare on May 20th, 1609 with the title Shakespeare's Sonnets Never Before Imprinted Thor prefix the volume a cryptic dedication to the only begetter of these in swing sonnets Mr. W.H. All happiness and that eternity promised by our ever-living poet with the well-wishing and adventure in setting forth. Now, many attempts have been made to determine the identity of W.H. that we find here. The two leading candidates are William Herbert, Earl of Pembroke and Henry Rethsley, Earl of Southampton. We will, however, not indulging in the intricacies of identity. Rather, here in this particular sonnet or in general discussion, rather we will discuss on the general nature of his sonnets. In fact, first 126 sonnets are addressed to this Mr. W.H. Obviously, his 116 is addressed to his fair friend W.H. Now the identity of that WH or fair pen is an another issue that we will try to understand in another lecture. Most probably you can pop up in my other lecture where I have discussion on Shakespearean sonnets. Now generally speaking, Shakespearean sonnets have been a riddle to the critics and readers alike. And in the mage of criticism and interpretation, it is more likely for one to lose his way than to get out of it. For those who believe that the sonnets display a chronological order of composition, the separate poems do not have much value in themselves, unless they feel uh, a kind of a developing situation shows the very definite pattern of sustained meaning, you know. So, there are two kind of criticism that we will find in Shakespeare and Sonnet. One is objectivity and another is subjective. Or some critic says, the poetry of self 
dramatizes and unfolding a psychological drama in full five acts. We can find out four characters, Shakespeare himself, W.H., the dark lady and the rival poet. Now, now what I am stating is that Wordsworth says that with the keys of these Shakespearean sonnets we can read much of the heart of William Shakespeare. But such kind of subjective writing has, has been opposed by such writers like uh, Robert Browning who said that Shakespeare even in his sonnets wrote dramas. And most probably we can find out the characters there that I have all mentioned, the four pillars of Shakespearean building. Now Shakespearean sonnet number 116 led me not to the marriage of two minds is an emphatic statement on the permanence of love, a love which by its very nature defies time. The sonnet asserts that love is unalterable, irremovable and constant. That love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the age of two. So here is the tug of war between transience and permanence, between the ravaging power of time and the permanent utility of love on the permanent emotions of love. So that tug of war which is a common theme has become a subject for 160. Now start reading this poem. Let me not to the marriage of two minds admit impediments. Love is not love, which alters when it alters and finds, or bends with the remover to remove. First few lines at once adds to our mind to a particular composition or a particular central topic of thesis. In order to establish this central thesis of permanency of love, Shakespeare uses a specifically an argumentative technique. First, he gives a proposal. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Within his initial proposition, a definition of love comes out. Love is a marriage of true minds. The word marriage here suggests a complete union of perfect margin. Shakespeare proceeds to argue and establish the validity of his proposition. He begins in the true fashion of a rhetorical argument by defining love in terms of negation. He says, love is not love which alters when it alters and finds or bends with the remover to remove. What these lines mean? He first establishes his point that if any emotional attachment is removable or if the object of such emotional attachment is transferable, then such emotion should never be the emotion of love. A true love can never be confused with that transitoriness of our emotions if it really happens. True love for Shakespeare can never find any alteration or removal. You know, some alternative comes, you change yourself. Somebody came, a strong emotion come and removes your emotion from that object. Then it is not a love. It is not the true love. So here Shakespeare defines the true essence of love. Shakespeare proceeds with argument with emphatic negation of any possibility of a removal or alteration of love that he has just spoken. 
in the lines that I have just quoted. And he negates that proposition, said, oh no. Then he continues with his basic argument. Now, proceeding to define in a straightforward manner what love really is. It is an ever fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never second. Shakespeare begins to offer images in order to establish this argument. He begins with the image of a bacon in a lighthouse, you know, a flashing light that has been used especially to guide pilot when he was landing in a foggy weather or in general landing at the sea coast which constantly emits light and which can withstand the terrible tempest on the sea. Shakespeare suggests that love is such a faculty of the mind that it constantly emits light in the hearts of the lover who can withstand the tempest of life. He proceeds with another argument and another image in support of his argument, in favor of his argument, he says, there is constant nature of love. It is the star to every wandering bark, whose oaths unknown, although his height be taken. Shakespeare here compares love with the pole star. The pole star that is believed to be steadfast never changing its position in the star. As the fixed position of the pole star helps erring seamen to be guided back to their right course, right path, similarly true love can guide erring men or women in their journey of life to their right paths. So here it says, although his height be taken, the position by the very position of the star, you can determine your way. Similarly, a true love can lead you in your chiseled way of life. Again, he builds his argument in terms of negatives. Love's not times full, though he lips and checks within his bending sickles, compass calm. Love alters, not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out even to the age of doom. Like a seasoned arguer, as, as like that of a lawyer, Shakespeare negates the idea that love is subservient to time. Love does not, unlike a fool, serve the whims and fancies of its master. So he is not a fool, he is not a jester, he is not a joker. Time is not the master of love either, so time can consume by its devouring power physical beauty, you know, rosy lips and cheeks, those earthly beauty, it does not have the power to devour love, the emotion. Like a rapper, he does not have the power to cut the grasses up to love. He comes to his most emphatic statement, emphatically states that love as an immortal passion continues to exist throughout time and will exist even to the age of doom as it is told in Bible, the destruction of this civilization. So until and unless there is destruction of the world, true love survives. That is the assertion. So, after the final assertion of this thesis, he affects a distant posture, you know, and throws his statement open to evaluate or criticism. In a tone of mock modesty, he says, if this be error, and upon me proved, I never write, nor no man ever loved. 
you know this is a very tactful way assisting the validity of this argument because it is impossible to prove that Shakespeare never wrote poetry and or that love never haunted the hearts of human individuals or failed love never haunted the hearts of human individuals. So Shakespeare's proposition and argumentative technique in this sonnet number 116 to a great time concludes true love is essentially immortal, permanent, inarguable and unfathomable. So Shakespeare's proposition of so Shakespeare arguments in favor of permanency of love or true love is a quite a dramatic presentation and here the villain in proposition is the ravaging time who proves himself to be powerful but love can withstand that power by its emotional attachment and such a theory such an argument is there in plenty of sonnets in Shakespearean writing as well as in Elizabethan writings. In sonnet number 75 by Penser, he says, Major thing die in dust, you shall live by fame. The love should live by fame and grow earthly things should die in dust. So similar proposition, similar arguments, similar tug of war between transience and permanence, between between time and love is so interesting and engrossing and so appealing. So I think you have got these points and understood the very structure of sonnet number 116 and how it arguably presents the theme tug of war between love and time, between permanency and transience. If there is any question, just pop up here, ask me question. I will make possible answers of your queries. Like, share, comment and obviously subscribe to my channel. Bye-bye.